Massachusetts, a lot of the people out in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, our friends on Pal Talk, they're, uh, they're getting buried. I was just, just talking to my dad when Titus picked me up uh, about 45 minutes ago. My dad saying he was going up. He's, he's got 40 inches on the ground. He doesn't know where to put it. With the next, He's got another foot on the way at night. So we're gonna, he doesn't know where he's going to put it. I said, well, get the sled dogs out. But anyways, we might need sled dogs on the way home. So. But anyway, so I'm glad you guys are with me. So uh, we have glad we could teach. I know in the other place, if it was snow, I'd have to cancel it. So this way, because I'm so close by, I mean, I'm only a minute or two, two minutes away, so I don't have to cancel it unless the power goes out. So don't don't say that. The power. <laughs> we don't want the power going out. All right. Should we have 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1? We're going to study 
First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.8 here uh, this evening. And we're going to see in this verse, Paul affirms the spiritual principle that the Mosaic law is useful if one uses it lawfully. That will be our subject here this evening. So without further ado, let's take that moment of silent prayer as we normally do. That means applying 1 John 1, 9 if necessary. And once we've done that, then we keep our, we stay in fellowship with God. We maintain our fellowship with God by bringing our thoughts into obedience to the Spirit who speaks to us through the teaching of the Word of God. That's when we're obeying the command of Ephesians 5, 18 to be filled with the Spirit in Colossians 3, 16 to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. So with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for another day to gather together with each other as members of the royal family of God and to learn of your plan for our lives through the study of the Bible. We thank you for the Bible, the completed canon of the scripture, and the gift of the Holy Spirit, who not only has inspired the scriptures for us, but also gives us understanding to them and guides us in the application of them. So we thank you for the indwelling spirit, and we also thank you for the fact that you indwell us as long, along with your son, and so that we have everything that we need to do your will. We thank you, Father, for uh, the logistical grace, the provisions for another day. We thank you for the food, shelter, and clothing, and uh, family and friends, and uh, the body of Christ, the Word of God. We thank you, Father, for not only the Thompsons opening up their home, but also, also those individuals who are listening on Pal Talk and listening on the website or viewing this class at a later date on the website. We thank you for them. And we just uh, pray, Father, this evening that you would guide us and direct us in our study of First Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. We pray that you would help all those in the audience to concentrate and to listen to what the Spirit's going to say to each one of us as individuals and as a, a local assembly, as a corporate unit. We also pray, Father, that you would empower the communi communicator to deliver your full counsel to your people so that they would be built up and edified and you and your Son, Jesus Christ, would be lifted up and glorified. We pray, Father, that everything will sound technically in the Thompson household, and also with the recordings and the sound and video from Pal Talk, give Titus wisdom with that. And we just, uh, Father, we just pray that as a result of this Bible class, again, all of us would continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that you and your Son, Jesus Christ, would be magnified, glorified. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. First Timothy 1, 1 is where you should be at. And as I said before, a few moments ago, we're going to study 1 Timothy 1, 8, which actually begins a new paragraph. In this verse, Paul affirms, as I also said before, the spiritual principle that the Mosaic law is useful if one uses it lawfully. And so beginning in verses, going verses 8 through 11, Paul rebukes the misuse of the Mosaic law by certain pastors in Ephesus who he doesn't name who sought to be teachers of the law. So remember, in verses 3 through 7, as we have been noting uh, the last couple of weeks, and we finished off verse 7 uh, Sunday, is that there's a group of pastors in Ephesus. We know that they're pastors because, of the, first of all, they were to uh, uh, fulfill their responsibilities of administrating the household of God. Economia speaks of their spiritual authority. They also wanted to be teachers of the law, so that tells us that they're teachers. Uh, also, they were, uh, and we see later on, uh, that uh, they, they misused the Mosaic Law. We'll see in these verses as well. They try to be teachers of it. And now Paul, in verses 8 through 11, uh, in contrast to their misuse of the law, Paul shows the proper use of the law. Now, this is very important for many reasons, why this is, uh, this is what Paul's doing here. What he's trying to do is he's, he's actually trying to protect the testimony of the church in Ephesus and actually the mission of the church in Ephesus, which is still our mission today, is that to get the gospel to out, throughout the world. And so what would happen if these pastors start to dominate the scene in Ephesus who were into the law that had been affected by the Judaizers teaching, that's going to affect their mission and their function as a church. Not, not to mention their spiritual lives and how detrimental it will be if they listen to their teaching. So what's going to happen is if they listen to the, these, false, to these false doctrine that is uh, promoted by these pastors who fell victim to the Judaizers, uh, if they do that, 
Then there'll be an attitude of exclusivism, meaning they'll exclude the Gentiles. See, this is what the Judaizers did. This is what Israel did. And the Judaizers are from Israel. Is that they, they rejected the Gentiles as part of God's plan of salvation. As we study this in the, in the book of Romans. So we see that the Gentiles, it was predicted that they would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So what happened with the Judaizers and the nation of Israel was guilty of this. And we saw this in the book of Jonah. Uh, it was an attitude in Israel. And it was an attitude that Israel is God's people and the Gentiles are not. And so therefore they never reach out to the Gentiles and offer them salvation. So that's, that's an attitude that could take place in Ephesus if, the, uh, if these individuals who are uh, listening to the Judaizers, these pastors who he doesn't name, if they got their way, they could hurt the testimony of the church, the mission of the church, which is to get the gospel to, out to every cre creature. But if they listen to the Judaizers that, and these pastors in Ephesus who fell victim to the Judaizers, they won't do this. And also, it's detrimental because they were misusing the law, as we saw, but it, it's a detrimental to their spiritual life as Christians in Ephesus because the law can't transform a sinner into an obedient child of God. It can't allow us to have experience sanctification and our deliverance from sin, Satan, this cosmic system. The law could never save us, and the law, they misuse the whole purpose of the law, which we're going to have to talk about here this evening. So that's detrimental because it's like uh, for, uh, people who are in like, uh, this Seventh-day Adventist, you know what I'm talking about. They have uh, they emphasize the law and the Sabbath keeping and all that. But that, the law was never designed, first of all, for Gentiles. Uh, the, the Mosaic Law. It was actually given to Israel, but the law was there was a purpose for the law. That was to reveal God's holiness. It was good, but what happens is the gospel is that aspect of the Word of God which transforms the sinner, that can save the sinner, that has the power to save the sinner. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. We saw that in Romans 1.16. The law is that aspect of God's Word that just served to condemn man and, sh and show him his need. So the law is great because it shows sinful man his need for a savior, that God's holy, he has his perfect standards, and you don't, you and I and the whole human race doesn't measure up. Now these people who are emphasizing the law misunderstood that. They were not doing, they were not using the law properly, and therefore they were not using the word of God properly, and that's why Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, you're to rightly or accurately divide the word of truth. And uh, this is what these pastors in Ephesus, who Paul doesn't name, were getting into. And, of course, he does name two. We'll see that in verse 20 with Hymenaeus and Alexander, one of which was teaching that the resurrection had already come, and Paul uh, actually excommunicated him from the church. He had, we're going to study that. He administered church discipline, and he, he handed him over to Satan, meaning he kicked him out of the fellowship of the church, and now he's in Satan's cosmic system, and God is going to let a, a certain measure of suffering, uh, pain, happen to this individual so he learns not to blaspheme. Slander the name of God. We'll get to that. So this is a very serious issue. One, it's going to hurt the growth of the church, individual members of the growth of the church, because they were misusing the law. They weren't using it properly. It would also hurt the testimony of the church and the mission of the church. God wants the gospel to go to every creature. Well, if they, if they listen to the, these false teachers in Ephesus, these pastors in Ephesus, that wasn't going to take place. So this is a very, very important issue here. Paul knows the stakes are great here. So he comes out guns blank, blazing. As we noted, usually in his epistles, he offers thanksgiving. Even to the th Corinthians, he offered thanksgiving to them. And he was upset with them in those two epistles that he wrote to, to, to the Corinthians. But he actually often uh, mentioned he had given thanks to God for them. He doesn't even do that in this epistle. He just comes right out and uh, going after the Ephesians, and in particular, these pastors, because it's going to hurt the life and testimony and the mission of the church in Ephesus. So look at 1 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope, our confident expectation of blessing. Remember we saw he's, ex he's expressing his authority. He's pulling the word apostle out to say, I'm, I'm an apostle from the Father's commandment and Jesus Christ, and you are going to listen to me. What I say in this epistle is critical. So you better, I'm exercising my authority here. And then he goes on to say, identifying the recipient, Timothy. He's his Paul's delegate. And Paul, Timothy is going to relate in this epistle everything he said. Timothy is going to do that. He's going to read it. He's going to uh, read it to this, teach this, uh, the, the congregation Ephesus. He's Paul's delegate. And then he identifies Timothy 
He's my true child in the faith, meaning he's my legitimate spiritual child on the basis of faith, faith in Jesus Christ. He's, I'm his mentor. I'm his spiritual father. So listen to him. He knows my ways. He knows exactly what I want. And then he says, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Grace is basically what he's going to say in this, in this epistle is grace, unmerited blessings to them. It is also mercy or compassion and that it's expressing God's concern for them. And also peace. There'll be peace if they respond to this epistle. There'll be peace in their hearts as individuals and as a church. As it stands now, there was division and problems in Ephesus. Now, he, made, he beginning in verse 3, he identifies the problem. As I urge you, upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men. And when he says instruct, he means order. Certain men not to teach not strange doctrines, but false doctrines. We get the term heterodoxy from that, false, false teaching. No one to pay attention, he says, to myths and endless genealogies. Basically, they were Jewish in nature, as we saw. And again, that's because the Jews would do this. They would get involved in the genealogy of the Old Testament, and they would put on their own imaginations and bad interpretation they would pull out these myths. They would propagate these myths. And it was basically speculation and the function of their imagination that they would teach these things, which were myths. And so Paul says, now don't waste your time with myths. You need facts. You need truth. You need absolute truth. You need my gospel. So he says, I don't want them to pay attention or be occupied with myths and useless genealogies, which give rise to me as speculation. Speculation is a weak word. It actually means pointless arguments. They were getting involved in arguments as a result of this teaching. And then he says, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith, or in other words, it's not getting involved in these things is not going to uh, help you fulfill your responsibility to administrate the household of God, which is by you being faithful. The word faith, they're actually speaking of an attribute that these men, these pastors were to have. Faithfulness, faithful studying, teaching, and setting an example. They weren't doing that. And therefore, as a result of they're not, them, these pastors not functioning properly and fulfilling their stewardship and administrating the household of God by study, teaching, and praying and setting an example, the church was involved in division. So it all started from the top. That's not always the case. Sometimes the pastor can be teaching the truth and they reject it. It can work both ways. Then it looks like, and then it says in verse 5, he contrasts the results of obeying Paul's teaching with their teaching. One, their teaching, the result of obeying their teaching is pointless arguments. The result of following Paul's teaching is love, love for one another. So he says, but the goal, or as we saw in the King James got it right, some of the older translations, the end, I shouldn't say, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. I'm not trying to say that to, to uh, smooth things over with a certain individual likes to promote uh, the King James, but I like to say if it's true, that if it's right, it's right, and if it's wrong, it's wrong. But the word goal there actually should be translated result because he's contrasting the results of following Paul's teaching with the, uh, these pastors in Ephesus who were teaching false doctrine and were occupied with the law, wanting to be teachers of the law. But the result, we can say, of our instruction, Christian instruction, the apostles and Timothy, is love, love for one another. And here's the source. From a pure heart, that means you have no unconfessed sin in your heart, and also, and you're filled with the Spirit. And then it says, from a pure heart, and then it goes on to say the second one, the second prepositional phrase, or the second um, uh, description of uh, this particular phrase, love, is a good conscience, meaning their standards are divine in quality and character because they're, 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 they're taking in the Word of God. The Word of God is the basis for their standards. And then it says a sincere faith. They have a faith in the Word of God. They're, you can't love, as we saw, Love for one another and love for God stems from, is based upon faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because from faith comes your obedience and love for one another. Very important. We've studied this in the past as well. So he said, this is what these guys were not involved in. Look at verse 6. It says, for some men, actually you could just say um, some men. Then it says, because they strayed from these things, what things? Love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith, meaning they weren't in fellowship with God and not loving one another. So he says, some men, because they've strayed from these things, meaning they've deviated from the truth, 
have turned aside to fruitless discussion. The word for fruitless discussion talks about meaningless conversation, talk. It's, it's almost synonymous with mere speculation in, in verse 4. Then it says in verse 7, he says that they do these things by wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they don't understand either what they're saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. Notice, they want to be teachers of the law. That means, that tells us something, that one of the things that they do is they teach. And that's a, and also it tells us the nature of the problem. They fell victim to the law, the Mosaic law. We'll have a lot to say about that tonight. Then it says in verse 8, But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according, sound teaching is according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which as we'll note is speaking of the Shekinah glory of Jesus Christ, with which, which gospel I've been entrusted with. Now, verse 8, if you look at verse 8, it says, But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Verse 8, it begins a series of statements that end in verse 11, that stand in direct contrast with Paul's statements in verses 3 through 7. So what he describes about these, Paul's t uh, these uh, pastors in Ephesus, who he doesn't identify but were involved in teaching false doctrine, he describes them in verses 3 through 7, what they were doing, who, what they were doing, they, uh, what they were uh, getting involved in, and now he's going to contrast that in verses eight through eleven. With uh, uh, he's going to make a contrast with those statements in verses three through seven. He's going to contrast those statements in verses three through seven with his statements in verses eight through eleven. Now remember, we just read in verses three through seven, Paul describes certain pastors. He doesn't identify them. In Ephesus, who desired to be teachers of the law and were teaching false doctrine. And the reason why they were teaching false doctrine is they were occupied with Jewish myths and pointless application, useless application of the genealogies of the Old Testament. So what's the contrast? The contrast is between Paul's apostolic teaching, where he talks about the proper use of the law and the accurate use of the law, with the improper use and misapplication of the law by these pastors in Ephesus. So here's the contrast. In verses 3 through 7, we have a picture of pastors in Ephesus who were misapplying the law. They were misusing it. And then in verses 8 through 11, Paul says, this is how you use the law. This is what the Word of God says how to use the law. This was the purpose of the law. So he's contrasting. Uh, verses 8 through 11, we have the proper use of the law, proper application of it. In verses 3 through 7, improper use and misapplication of the law by these pastors. So there's the contrast between the good, right use of the law and the improper use of the law. So the misapplication of the law by these pastors makes it absolutely imperative that Paul presents the proper application of it. So remember, when this epistle gets read in Ephesus, these pastors are going to get a copy of this, and it's going to be read to them, and Timothy's going to confront them. He's told to confront them. So the first thing he's going to, they're going to find out is they get, they get nailed in verses 3 through 7. And then in verses 8 through 11, because they don't know how to use the law, Paul comes out and says, how I want you to use the law and how it's supposed to be used. And it's not for a Christian, it's for the unsaved, as we, as we just read. Now look at verse 8 again. He says, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Now when he says we know, that, that word is the, is the, in the Greek is either, is the verb there. Either is the word. And it means to know as an accepted fact, to affirm as an accepted fact. So here the word means to affirm an accepted fact in the sense that what Paul is asserting about the law here in verses 8 through 11 is inspired and confirmed by the Holy Spirit and accepted by the apostles. So when he says we know, see, this is why, the, this is why you should go back to listen and study the original languages. Because even though the translations, a lot of the English translations, we got a lot of great ones. Sometimes they don't bring out these nuances in the original. There's different words for no knowledge or knowing something in the New Testament. For instance, uh, there's one, uh, Gnosko, which is uh, basically uh, one, talks about acquiring knowledge. This word either means that you have possession of the facts. So this is a different verb for knowing. 
and the Greek. And this means to affirm as an accepted fact. It actually means that what I'm saying, he says, we aff- no, it means we affirm. We know this is an accepted fact. What is an accepted The way I'm going to tell you how the law should be applied by you guys is an accepted fact, accepted by the apostles, myself included, and confirmed by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy, when he says we know, the Holy Spirit is basically implied as confirming this proper use of the law, which Paul just points out in verses 9 through 10. So we see the first person plural form of the verb is when he says we know, the word we is what we call an exclusive we. That means it's referring to Paul and his fellow apostles, associates like Timothy, who and those who read this epistle who were in agreement with him, in contrast to those pastors in Ephesus who sought to be teachers of the law and were not using it properly. So when he says we, he's saying those who agree with me. We, in a sense, that, that the apostles, Timothy, uh, my delegates, and also those in Ephesus that follow and adhere to my teaching. Remember, these pastors, by not teaching the gospel and following the Judaizers' teaching, were rejecting Paul's authority. That's why he pulls the word apostle out, and the apostle by the command of, commandment of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. He pulls that out because he wants these pastors to hear that. When this epistle's read to them, he wants them to hear that. He wants them to hear that loud and clear because they were rejecting his authority. And that's one of the great things about studying this epistle. The more I study Paul's writings, I am amazed, especially with Corinth, his problems in Corinth, Galatia, this epistle, the Ephesians, oh, the, the Ephesian problem he's having here. It, makes, it gives me comfort as a pastor to know that the great apostle Paul, his teaching was rejected. His te- and, you know, a lot of t- one of the hardest things to do is, uh, as a pastor is that you know, you're teaching the truth, and then when people reject it, 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 you know, it first stuns you when it happens. But then you, you start looking at the parable of the seed and the soil, and you look at the prophets of Israel in our Lord himself. And the apostles, his apostles, you're not the first one who has the teaching rejected. They reject not you, they reject God who sent you, as you've got to always remember as a pastor. It's the Holy Spirit, if you're teaching tr- the accurate doctrine, if you're interpreting it correctly, you're, you, that means you, then you're now the Holy Spirit speaking to you and, you're, and he's flowing through you. But when you don't, uh, when you don't interpret it correctly, you know, th- that's when you get into problems and that's, not when you're not, that's when you're not following the Spirit. So correct in- interpretation is absolutely imperative. So if you are interpreting correctly the passage, and, they re- and the Spirit is therefore teaching uh, through you, then they reject you. It's not you that they're rejecting. They're rejecting. They're rejecting the Holy Spirit. So if I miss, if I'm not teaching properly a passage, and you reject it, you're not going to be uh, censured by God, or disciplined by God, or rebuked by God. I will be. And, uh, and, of course, all pastors have, grow, have to grow, so sometimes, a lot of times, it, has down, it comes down to growth. But, when you, you know, there are certain things you can't, you can't, uh, uh, you can't get wrong. You've got to know the you've got to be sure on salvation. You've got to be sure about eternal security. You've got to be sure about the person and work of Christ. Those things you can't mess up on. And so, we see here that when uh, Paul, Paul in this epistle is being rejected here, his authority is being rejected, which came from the Lord. So if you're a pastor and you've had, you've gone through a church split or you've gone through a reject, and I know guys who have, if you go through stuff like that, you get uh, uh, people rejecting or criticizing your teaching and you know you're teaching it properly, then, you know, be encouraged because Paul, the great apostle Paul, who everybody reveres in Christianity today, was not revered by the people, the churches he started. Many of them, the Ephesians, uh, the Corinthians, they rejected his teaching outright. They went after the false teachers, in particular the Judaizers, and Paul was the one who led them to the Lord, and yet they rejected him. And so uh, it gives me comfort as a pastor, uh, because I've had, uh, obviously, like many of you know, had that happen to me where you have a group of people rejecting flat out the Word of God, and it's, it can be disconcerting, but you get encouraged when you study the Bible and you see guys like Paul go, have gone through the same thing that you have gone through. Every pastor does. Every, every evangelist does as well. So when he says, he says, he says we're affirming something, that it's accepted by the Christian church. And what's that? The law is good if, and here's the condition, if one uses it lawfully. Now when he says the law is good, that's uh, the word for law is the word nomos. In fact, I just gave, uh, sent a an article that uh, Titus put up on the website. Thanks, Titus, for doing that so promptly. And uh, on uh, under Israelology, uh, there's a 
uh, an article on the Mosaic Law, so I would suggest you downloading that. But uh, uh, nomos is the word for law, and in that article I talk a lot about it. But here it's, it's uh, it, not only in the scripture, it's, but most of the time it's used for the Mosaic Law or the Old Testament scriptures as a whole. We saw this particular word all over Romans. It was used quite a bit in Romans. And it's accompanied by the adjective kalos, which is translated good. Now, this word nomos means law, and it's referring again to the Mosaic Law, and specifically, it's referring to the moral code or the Ten Commandments, which is indicated by the context, and I'll show you that in a minute. But remember this, the law, they broke out, the, 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 the law was an indivisible unit, but it could be broken out in divisions. There was the ceremonial aspect of the law, you know, talking about you know, the, 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 all the different, um, the animal sacrifices, the blood animal sacrifices. Christ fulfilled the ceremonial aspect of the law. We also have the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, and that's uh, in, in Exodus chapter 20. So with that we have that aspect of the law as well. So, you know, all these the, these different aspects of the law, but they're, they're, though they can be, you can look at the law from different uh, areas. They, it's one indivisible unit. Now, uh, here, we, we know he's not just talking about the entire Old Testament. We know from the context that he's speaking, specifically when he says law, he's speaking about the Ten Commandments. He's speaking about that moral code. And, and, the, and the context tells us this. Let me ex explain. First of all, uh, to demonstrate that when he says law here, that he's referring to the Ten Commandments aspect of the Mosaic Law. The first thing that indicates this is that when Paul uses this term, he always has the Mosaic Law in mind in his writings, or the Old Testament as a whole. Secondly, when he speaks of the law in verses 8 through 10, it has the same ethical concerns as those of the Mosaic Law. Okay? It has the same ethical concerns of those of the Mosaic Law. The list of vices in verses 9 through 10 is similar to the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And as Knight points out, he also, that where Paul elsewhere speaks of the law and gives ethical lists, the Mosaic law, the moral law, is in view. So when he, you know, what we, have, what we have here is a vice list. If you look at verses, look at verse 9. It's what we, verses 9 and 10 is what we call in, in, uh, by Bible teachers, a vice list. It's an ethical list or something like that. So he says, realizing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person. Then he goes listing off all these sinners, not sins, of types, categories of sinners. For those who are lawless, rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy, profane, for those who kill their fathers and mothers for murderers, and immoral men and homosexual and kidnappers and liars and perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. Now, each of those sins is, has, is related to the Ten Commandments. For instance, murder. Thou shalt not murder. And there's, uh, uh, you should honor your father and mother. Well, here they're talking about killing your father and that's, a, that's a, a, a gross violation of honoring your father and mother. Every one of those sins that he mentioned is related in some aspect to the Ten Commandments. And we'll go there. I'm not going to do it tonight, but I'm going to go. We'll do that to, beginning tomorrow. But I'm trying to show you when he says the law is good, he's talking about the Ten Commandments. And the first part of the context that indicates this is those sins. They're all related to breaking some aspect of the Mosaic Law. Thirdly, in verse 4, Paul has already mentioned that these pastors in Ephesus were occupied with myths and useless genealogies, which we know were Jewish in nature. He also uses the phrase, teachers of the law, nomo didaskalos, which is another clear indication that when Paul uses the term law in verse 8, he's referring to the Mosaic law. The fourth reason why this word law in verse 8 is referring to the law, Mosaic law is that Paul is contrasting his use of the law with these unidentified pastors who misused the law and wanted to be teachers of the law. The reference to the genealogies in verse 4, which occurs in the narrative portion of the law in Genesis or the Pentateuch, indicates that this word law in verse 8 is a reference to the Mosaic law. And lastly, the word's articular construction, no moss has an article before it, that indicates to the reader that this word is well known to them. So, let me give you an answer. Here's a classic example where the translators are a little confused. But if they look at the context, they would have to say in verse 9 that the word law should be capitalized. Look what it says in verse 8. But we know that the law is good. See, it's capitalized. It's capitalized in verse 7. Look at verse 7. 
wanted to be teachers of the law. Notice it's capitalized, but look at verse 9. All of a sudden, they switch to a small l, which tells you they're a little confused here, realizing the fact that law, not the law, but law, and that law should be, referring to the Mosaic law, should be capitalized. Why? Because of all the, the reasons I gave you. For instance, he's been in context speaking about these pastors in Ephesus who were misusing what? The law. They wanted to be teachers of the law. The genealogies and the myths are all Jewish in nature. And we see that everything he mentions in verses 9 and 10, those sins, are related to breaking some aspect of the Ten Commandments. That's why I say when he uses the term law in verses 8 and 9, he's speaking of the Mosaic law, and specifically, he's speaking of the Ten Commandments. Okay? So sometimes, we study this in Romans. You can read the article in detail on the website. And when Paul uses law, once in a while, it's not the law, Mosaic law, or the Old Testament. But most of the time, it, you have to pay attention to the context. But most of the time, he's speaking of the Mosaic law, and in particular, or the Ten Commandments, or the whole Old Testament. Because sometimes, you know, uh, he, he, if we use the term law, it could refer to the whole Old Testament. He used it that way in Romans. But here we know he's speaking of the Mosaic law, because what specifically the Ten Commandments, because of the sins that he mentions in verses 9 and 10 are all related to breaking some aspect of the Ten Commandments. Now, that's an example of interpreting based upon the con what the context is telling us. Okay? So that's, that's one great important aspect of interpretation, is pay attention to context. Uh, and, uh, for instance, I'll give you, in, in, in our day and age, we have the problems with sound bites, and people think it's sound bites, and you can take somebody out of context. You know, I can just imagine if somebody wanted to take me out of context, all they'd have to do is take a little snippet of me. And then they could, they do this to politicians all the time. And that's why politicians speak in sound bites now. And you, 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 they can take a little snippet and they can abuse you. They can abuse you. They can distort what you say. Take a little snippet and take it out of context. They could make me sound like Hitler if they wanted to. And I think the day is coming. That that's what they're going to do to pastors in this country with the media and everything, they're going to go, they're going to, Satan's going to end up taking a shot at guys like myself on the internet or television and radio and try to distort and try to twist and get public opinion against us. That's coming and it's already here, by the way. Now look at verse 8. He says, verse 8, but we know that the law is good. He says, the law is good. Now the word good is kalos, a kalos, excuse me. It's an adjective and it's making an assertion about the law. That it's, it, when he says it's good, it means it's useful. It's good in the sense that you can use it. And we know what he means, it, when he says good, it means useful because Paul is contrasting his use of the law with these pastors in Ephesus who were misusing the law. So when he, uh, uh, when he uses the term the law is good, he, in what sense? What sense is it good? It's good in the sense that it's useful. Because and we know that because it's an ambiguous term. It's a very broad term, this word kalos. And when he, so we know what he means good. He means good in the sense that it's, it's, it's uh, useful. So he's saying here to us that the law is only useful for us as Christians if we use it properly. It's only good and useful for an unsaved person if he uses it properly. That's what he's saying here. Now, when he says if one uses it lawfully, that's a uh, basically a, a third class a, Fifth class conditional statement. We have, first of all, the word for if there is the word aon, which is translated if, and it's a conditional particle. And then with it, we have the indefinite pronoun tis, which is translated one. And then we have the verb in subjunctive form kreoma, which is translated uses. And then with it, we have the, the intensive personal pronoun altos, which is translated it. And then we have the adverb, which is translated lawfully. It's the word nominos. He's using a word play here. The word law, nomos, and then lawfully, nominos. So he's having a word play here. He's saying the law is good if you use it lawfully. Now, the conditional particle, that word if there, it's used with the subjunctive mood of the verb kreoma, which is translated uses, and it forms what we call a fifth class conditional statement. In the Greek, there's four different, uh, four different uh, uh, conditional statements. But the, uh, this one is, the fifth class condition is related to the third class condition. And that means it's speaking of a present general condition. He's actually, when he says, if you look at the sta statement here, he says, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. He's actually, with the fifth class conditional statement here, 
teaching a principle. It's a principle that's true for all time. It's a spiritual axiom is what he's doing. Sometimes he uses the fifth class condition that way. Now when he says, if one uses it lawfully, the word one there, speaks of any member of the human race, without exception and distinction, it doesn't make any, it's not speaking of anybody in particular, it's just using whoever it is, whoever might try to use the law, it's useful to them if they use it pr properly. Now the word kreoma, which is translated uses in your Bibles, it actually means to apply. And it means to apply the law, because Paul is addressing the misapplication of the law by these pastors in Ephesus. And we know that because Paul, these pastors were occupied with Jewish myths and genealogies and the narrative portions of the Pentateuch. They were not using the Mosaic law properly. And they didn't understand its threefold purpose and were thus misapplying it. It's like people today who emphasize you have to obey the Sabbath. Or they use tithing. Tithing is for Old Testament Israel. A giving has nothing, in church age giving, which Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, and our Lord talked about, never mentions tithing. And that tithing was a form of taxation in Old Testament Israel. They had a fund. They had to keep the, they had to take care of the Levitical priests. Remember? They were uh, devoted exclusively for the Lord. They had to take care of the tabernacle or the temple when the temple was up there. They had to maintain these things. And the tithing was used, put to it, those things. But, you know, we don't, that's a misapplication of an example in our day and age of a misapplication of the law. Uh, for instance, you know, people say they want to, you've got to keep the Ten Commandments to go to heaven. Well, the Ten Commandments only serve to condemn us. The Ten Commandments, no one's ever been saved by keeping the Ten Commandments. That's not what they were designed for. That's a classic example today of people, and I, I remember somebody, a guy I used to work with, and I was driving home from lunch with him, he got all mad at me, and I wasn't, I wasn't being mean, I was being my sweet, lovable self and being gentle. I was. I, God knows I was. And I just said, you know, well, you can't get saved by keep. You know, he says, oh, I keep the Ten Commandments. I said, well, that, that can't get you into heaven. Oh, I said, what do you think he sent Jesus' his son to, 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 to the cross for? Well, that kept him silent. I was like, well, you know, the whole point is you couldn't keep the law, and I couldn't keep the law perfectly. So there's a perfect classic example of people. You probably know people like that in your family or friends who say, well, are you going to go to heaven? You ask them. They say, yeah, I keep the Ten Commandments. Oh, do you? You keep them perfectly. Well, I've never, you know, you rattle off, like, do you take adultery? I've never committed adultery. Have you ever lusted at a woman in, her heart, in your heart? Or a man after in your heart? Uh, yeah. Well, then you just broke the law because Jesus said, if you lust at a woman in, in your heart, you've committed adultery with her already. See, God doesn't distinguish the thought from the action because <laughs> it's all said to him. So there, see, these people misapply the law. You know, you have to obey the Sabbath. You know, I remember I, I, when I was, a, I, I got into this years, when I first got saved, I, uh, this, me and this other guy, we listened to this guy named George Armstrong, and uh, he's dead now. And uh, he, had, he, he's, he, he was a cult. And I'll tell you why he was a cult, because he didn't believe that the Holy Spirit was a person. I listened to that, I was like, this is whack. But he pushed the law. He didn't believe, he didn't, he didn't believe, he was into, he, he, he thought the church is the new Israel. That's false doctrine. We don't replace Israel. That's replacement theology. That's false doctrine. That's a misapplication of the word of God. That's a misuse of the word of God in the law. But uh, we see that these guys, they, he used to misuse the law. He said you had to keep the Sabbath. I'll never forget, you know, we were musicians. So Saturday was a big day for musicians. <laughs> and so it was like, we, you know, for, then we ran into J. Bird McGee on the radio and he was like, and I was listening to him today as some teams of his, and he's like saying, you're not saved by the works of the law. The law, the law is only designed, you know, to, to show you know, basically what I've been teaching. So it was like pretty funny. It was like, what a relief. You know, we're saved by faith, Lord, and Christ alone, not by keeping the works of the law. But notice the burden that comes on you. That's why I feel, you know, I, almost, I feel bad for people who are into that stuff because they're burdened. I mean, they must, you become neurotic. That's what the Pharisees were. They become neurotic. They were like, you know, worried about, you know, all kinds of non-essential things, all cra kind of crazy things. And that's a sad, that's a sad thing that you see happen among Christians. So we see that the, the, this is what's going on here. He's teaching a spiritual principle in verse 8. That's true. It's an axiom. And these guys were not using it properly. These pastors in Ephesus who were listening to the Judaizers, who mistaught the law, who misapplied the law, Paul goes after them in Galatians and Romans, the Judaizers. You're not by saved by the works of the law. You're saved by faith in Christ. The word of the law just serves to reveal your sinful nature, God's holiness, and lead you to the Savior. 
and these guys and, and these guys didn't get that, and uh, it's because of arrogance, of course. Now, the present tense of this word krauma, which is translated uses in your Bibles, is what we call a gnomic present. It's used here to describe something that's true any time or does take place. And what does that mean here? It says that the law is useful if one does at any time use it correctly. The words in the middle voice, it's an indirect middle, and it means that the subject acts for himself or in his own interest. What does that mean to us? It indicates that if any member of the human race does apply the Mosaic law correctly, lawfully, they are acting in their own interest. It's in their own benefit. Now, that's what the word saying, the middle voice is saying in the original. The Greek individual could understand that. That's why I have to bring this out to you. It's giving you more details. The translation's fine. You don't lose any doctrine there, but you lose a lot of details. Now, the adverb, which is translated uh, in your Bibles, lawfully, is the word nominos. It's a play on words. It's a play on the word law there, nomos. And nomo didaskalos, which is translated teaches of the law. So Paul's using a little word play, using all these words that are related to nomos, the law. So this word nominos means lawfully. In what sense? Because he says in verse 8, if you look at it, but we know that the law is good, useful, if one uses it lawfully. What does he mean by lawfully? Well, it means lawfully in the sense of being according or in, uh, according to the intended threefold purpose of the law. When he says, if you use it lawfully, that means if you use it the way it was intended. It indicates that the law is useful for a person if he correctly or properly uses it. In other words, it, it is useful if one understands and applies its threefold purpose. In particular, if one understands that it reveals God's perfect standards, personal sins committed by man, and his sinful nature, nature as well as need, as his need for a savior. So this usage of the law is reflected in Paul's statements in verses 9 and 10. So he's saying, you know, this is something it brings out. If you misapply the word of God, it could be, de- it could be devastating. You, it's like, uh, you better, you better, because you, you could really do a lot of damage. And that's why it's so bad with false teaching out there. Uh, I got this, this one guy uh, that uh, is into the, he's all screwed up on the rapture. And you don't mess around with the rapture. The time of the rapture, it hasn't, uh, for instance, Paul booted Hymenaeus out of the fellowship of the church and pastor because he said that the resurrection had already taken place, the rapture. He threw him out of the fellowship of the church because this guy was teaching false doctrine. He would have let him back in if he repented, but he hadn't. So he was removed from the fellowship of the church. So, and, uh, you know, there's this one guy today uh, in email, and he's a classic example. Doesn't know, doesn't know how to interpret the Bible correctly. He has a lot of false teaching, and he screws up a lot of people. And the baby Christians who listen to that can get easily confused. So I don't like guys like that. I mean, I don't. I mean, it's not the personal. I don't like what he's saying. And he's just, it's just garbage. So that's why uh, your pastor should be pointing out, uh, anytime uh, you see me get a little gruff and I go after these things, it, I, it's nothing personal. All, I, you know, I, you know, but it, what it is, is you're teaching, you're misrepresenting God. You're mis- if you misrepresent his ways, if you misrepresent what he's saying, how would you like to be twi- have your words twisted? Have you ever had that happen to you? You, tell, you, you know, I remember that happened to me. They, they, they're taking words, that I, they were twisting things and t- making me, saying I said certain things that I didn't say. What could I do? I wasn't going to go back and forth with people. I just said, okay, that's what you're saying. Fine. God knows it's not true. But, you know, God has to deal with it every day. And that's why I try to be as conscientious and work as hard as I can in the Bible, in the scriptures, and treat this as what it is. It's holy. It's God's word. And just think what God has to put up with every day with false teachers. Every day, people are quoting his scripture, quoting it to murder people, quoting it to, I mean, there's so many people who are nuts out there, teaching false doctrine, uh, teaching that there's no, uh, teaching that you could lose your salvation, teaching that there's no resurrection of the church, teaching all this stuff. They're just, they're, all they are is they're dangerous and just think that God is slandered every day. They blaspheme God. They misrepresent God because they're claiming to speak for God. And yet, if they're not speaking for God, they're blaspheming him. They're misrepresenting him. False doctrine, which Paul's addressing here, is a terrible thing. And a lot of Christians don't, don't want to have confrontations, and they don't like it uh, when pastors uh, get angry at other, other people teaching false doctrine. They want everybody just to get along. Well, some people you can't get along with. Some people, it's war. Okay? Especially when it comes to false doctrine. You will get a war for me. 
because that's misrepresenting God. And this is what Paul's so upset about. They're misusing God's word. And they're taking, by misusing God's word, they're, they're saying things about God's, they're claiming to say God says this when he's not. Now think about that. And it must be, I mean, I mean God's not frustrated, but, you know, it's, that, that's incredible. And yet show you how patient and merciful God is that he doesn't strike us dead. He, he's tolerant and patient. But, you know, you know, this is what happens to God every day. And if you've ever had that happen to you, it can be, it's, it's disconcerting. And, it is, you know, and you can, you can uh, comfort yourself knowing that God deals with this every day. So, actually, uh, as a Bible teacher, if they misquote you or mis -say, uh, mis uh, tell you, say that you said certain things and you didn't, don't feel bad because God has it happen to them every day with false teaching. So, the, this statement in verse 8. It's what we call a, a promise of a uh, first. It's a first class condition. Uh, the promise is first of all that's the premise, and that's if one uses it lawfully. It's 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 back. It's usually one goes before, the promise comes before the apodosis. The promise is the premise. The apodosis is the conclusion based upon the premise. So the promise, the premise is if one uses it lawfully, the law, then uh, the law is useful. That's what he's saying. So if we use it lawfully, it's useful to us. It's a spiritual principle that Paul is speaking of here. So this principle here, in verse 8, helps to expose the error of these pastors in Ephesus who sought to be teachers of the law. And now, so this leads us to the, this principle here. What's the purpose of the law? What's the threefold purpose of the law? There are many usages of the law, but the three main purposes of the law, I want to spend the rest of the evening on. And this is what these guys were misusing the law because they didn't understand the threefold purpose of the law. They, they, and, and this is what he addresses in, in, in verses 8 through 11. So when we talk about the Bible, the, what the Bible teaches as to how to use the law, well, first of all, we need to know that the Mosaic Law was designed to provide a standard of righteousness, and in the process, it revealed the righteousness, the holiness, and goodness of God. So the first aspect of the law was to show that God was holy. That, and show his standards. For instance, people say, "I want." To, how, if you're going to ask him a question, are you going to go to heaven? Uh, well, I'm a good person. Then you stop and say, well, wait, wait a second. God's standards are perfect. He's perfection. He doesn't sin. It's, it's abhorrent to his nature. He doesn't contradict himself. He always operates according to his perfect holy character. You and I don't measure up. Okay? So, the law tells us flat out what God's standards are. See, people have certain, people have the cosmic system standards. Most people have, and even the church today, their standards are not the word of God. Their standards are the, what the devil's world says. And for instance, I'll give you a perfect example. You, you see the uh, you see this whole thing with uh, they're now in certain denominations that they have homosexuals as pastors and they have women as pastors, totally contradicting the word of God. But see. They don't agree with the standards of the Bible. They think that the Bible is wrong. In fact, many of these denominations don't even believe that the Bible is inspired by God. And that is the death of a church. Most people are dead. And so we see that the first, that the law tells us, the law tells us God's perfect standards. That we don't measure up. Look at Romans. Look at Romans chapter 7. Look at Romans chapter 7. Look at verse 7. Or actually, yeah, look at, uh, look at verse 1. Look at uh, Romans 7, 1. In the, in the context, this chapter is found in the midst of Paul talking about sanctification, how to experience his sanctification. In chapter 6, he talks about the positional aspect of sanctification. How God, what God's done for you through the Spirit and the Son, and... What he, how he views you, crucify with Christ, die with Christ, buried with Christ, raised in Christ. Then he says in verse chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, he shows the, tells the Christians, and particularly he's talking to the Jewish Christians, that you're dead to the law. You died with Christ and you're raised with Christ. You're now married to another. Look at verse 1, Romans 7, 1. Or do, and in the process, he's going to tell us about the purpose of the law. Or do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, 
Jews, Jewish Christians, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. Now, he is the example of marriage. He's not teaching about marriage. He's using marriage to illustrate that we're dead to the law. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law concerning her husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man, married to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him, Christ, who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. Uh, you know when he says the members of our body were aroused by the law? It's a good illustration. I was listening to McGee one time. There was this Indian, Christian Indian, American Indian. And the people were at, he was with these Christians and they couldn't understand the purpose of the law. They were confused. And he, was, he alluded to this, that the sinful passions were aroused by the law. He said he was in this place and it said was back in the you know, early 1900s and people in the West, Midwest, would chew, chew tobacco and all that. And it said one place had a sign, don't spit. Well, he walked in and the place, you were all, they, they had spit all over the floor. You put a sign up and what happens? The people spit on the thing and he's just told not to spit. But he says, if you go into the home, somebody's home, he noticed in somebody's home that no spit was anywhere. There was no sign. Because what? They were what? In, his, in the family of God. So when you're in the family, when you're in the family, you're not going to do the spit around the house. You're in the family. Same thing with God's family. Once we're in His family through faith alone and Christ alone, you know we're, we're going to we're, we're going to be obedient. To, we, we want to be obedient to the law. Whereas the law, that sign, actually aroused the said nature. The, you tell them not to do it, and what do they do? They go and do it. They spit when they're not supposed to. Well, this is what he's saying about the law. It aroused, it, it gets the sin. It activates the sin nature because the sin nature. What does it do? It rebels against the law. That's the way it is. That's the nature of it. Now, look what he says in verse uh, 6. But we know we've been released from the law, having how? Having died to that which by, to that by which we were bound, so that we may serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Because he's anticipating some uh, twisting what he's teaching. May it never be. Absolutely not. On the contrary. Listen, he says, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about, about, known about coveting if the law had not said you shall not covet. So the law had a useful purpose. It, it, it identified sin in his life. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, that's the sin nature, produced in me coveting of every kind. Why? Because the sin nature, by nature, goes against the law. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came in, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death to me. So notice that the law can't give you life. It just kills you. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, speaking of the sin nature, and through it killed me. So then, he affirms the law. And it actually, it sounds just like what he's saying in, in 1 Timothy 1.8. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and it's righteous and good. Therefore, did that which is good cause it become a cause of death to me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. So this, the law is good. It's holy. Uh, let's see if I can find that other passage. I get that. That was the one. Now, when we talk about the law, so there, it's telling us, it's, Paul's saying in that passage, the law tells us, identify sin for us. It can't give us life, though. It can't, it can't give us life because we can't measure up to it. Our sin nature makes it impossible for us to keep God's law. So that's why he had to die. We had to die. Through the Spirit, we die with Christ, we're raised with Christ. He gives us the Spirit, and it's through the Spirit that we can serve God. But trying to keep the law without the Spirit, we can't do it. We need the Spirit. So, when we talk about the law, the law was given to provide a standard of righteousness, and in the process it revealed the holiness of God. Now, the law was given at Mount Sinai to Israel to reveal a holy God and to demonstrate the reality of an infinite gulf that separated sinful man from a holy God. Secondly, 
as we just read in Romans. The law was given to identify sin and re reveal man's sin and bankrupt condition is guilty before God. Look at Romans chapter 3. Look at verse 19. Look at Romans 3.19. Romans 3.19, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become, become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, that means meritorious actions, trying to be obedient to the law and to gain the approbation of God, to be justified, to be accepted by God. He says, because by the works of the law, no flesh, no human being will be justified in his sight. Now look what he says. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift, not by the law, but as a gift, by His grace, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith, this was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where that is boasting? It is excluded by what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Look at Galatians. Go to Galatians, chapter 2, verse 16. Galatians 2, 16. Galatians 2, 16. Nevertheless, knowing that a man or you can say a woman, person, is not justified by the works of the law, meritorious actions, trying to be obedient to the law to get justified, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Why? How come you can't get saved by keeping the law, the Ten Commandments? Because you'd have to be perfect in your obedience. God's law demands perfect obedience. That's why his son kept it perfectly, Jesus. But we couldn't. Why couldn't we? Because we have a sin nature. Jesus could keep it perfectly because he's the son of God. And he has no sin nature. Now, you, and so what we see is if you, if you break up one aspect of the law, you hold your place in Galatians, but look at James. We can't, be, we can't give the perfect obedience to the law that the law requires in order to get justified. If you want to get justified, the law would give you eternal life if you could keep it perfectly. But nobody could do that. Look at James chapter 2. Look at verse 9. James 2, 9. He says, But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he's become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, he's referring to the Ten Commandments here, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you did not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So you screw up once, you can keep it perfectly, but screw up once, you're done. God condemns you. You say, that's not fair. Well, God's holy and perfect. That's fair of God to do. It's consistent with his character and nature. He's perfection and you're not. It comes down to, you have to be humble and say, I ain't perfect. So I, I think it's so easy when you talk to an unbeliever, say, are you per you, and they always say, well, I'm a good person. I say, are you perfect? And they say, hey, yeah, you are a good person. Compared to me, yeah, you're probably a better person than me. Or to Hitler. But compared to God? No. God's, God set the bar way out of our reach. Not because he's been a jerk, but because, because who he is. He's holy. He can't help it if he's holy. <laughs> so therefore, that's why he had to send the son to do what we couldn't do. Now look at, so we, uh, let me show you something. Uh, 
Go back to Romans. Don't lose your place in Galatians, but look at Romans chapter 8. He sent his son to do something we couldn't do. Look at Romans 8.1. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, save us. Weak as it was through the flesh, because it only made the sin nature, it activated the sin nature. God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned the sin nature in the flesh as human nature. So why? So that the requirement of the law, what's that? Perfect obedience, might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now go to Galatians chapter 3, which will be our, might be our last passage. We're near the end here. Look at Galatians chapter 3. As J. Hampton Keatley III said, he says, and I'm quoting from him, like the blood alcohol test is designed to prove men are drunk, so the law is designed to prove men are sinners under the wrath of God. Isn't that a great quote? So it's just like the blood alcohol test. They give you a blood, uh, an alcohol test that they think you're drinking and driving, you're drunk. They give you the breathalyzer test or whatever, and that it reveals you're, if you're drunk or not. Well, the, the Mosaic Law shows us, it reveals what, that we're sinners. It says, shows us for what we are. I like to use the mirror. If you're a teenager, you know, when you're a teenager, sometimes you, know, when I, you, know, you have acne. Well, one of the last things you want to see is a mirror. So, you, you know, in a bright light and everything, and you see your acne. So the law kind of sh is like showing a teenager is acne. It shows us that we're sinners. It shows us all our blemishes. I like that one better. You might think it's gross, but I like that one too. Now, God's holy law, as we come to the end here, God's holy law reveals to man just who and what he is namely sinful and separated from God by an infinite gulf that he's unable to bridge in his own human strength. Now lastly, the law was given to shut up men to faith. It was, dis it was excluding the works of the law or any system of works as a system of merit for either salvation or sanctification. It was designed to lead us to Christ. See, this is what the people in Ephesus, those pastors, they weren't seeing the purpose of it. Remember Paul says it's not for a righteous man, a saved Christian. It's for and he lists these people. He's characterizing the unsaved in 1 Timothy 1, 9, and 10 with all those sins. So then the law was designed to lead us to faith in Christ. He was showing us God's holy. We're not, uh oh, what can I do? Well, he is the Savior. It points us to the, it's like a sign pointing us to the Savior. Faith in him. Now, Galatians chapter 3, look at that. And we'll close. Look at Galatians 3, 19. Galatians 3.19, why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed, that's Christ, would come to whom the promise has been made. Now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given, which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law. That means the human race, if you didn't have the Ten Commandments, you didn't have, see, every form of law has some aspect around the world, has some aspect of the Ten Commandments involved. For instance, murder is, is considered a, a, a crime in every nation of the world. So where did that come from? That came from God, okay? That was before, even before the Mosaic Law was given on Mount Sinai. It was manifested in the book of Genesis that everybody, including unbelievers, had an awareness that murder was wrong and adultery was wrong. They had that inherent law, as we saw. So he's saying, but before faith came, so it basically it kept the human race from destroying itself. But before faith came, <coughs> excuse me, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was to the later be revealed. Therefore, the, this is what he says. The law has become our tutor. The tutor means, it was in the ancient world, with the Greeks and the Romans, the tutor would be somebody that took you to school. Took you to school. So therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. 
But now that faith has come, we're no longer under the tutor. That's what these pastors in Ephesus should have been. That's what he's trying to tell them. We're under, we've had faith in Christ. We're no longer under the tutor, the law. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So that's the purpose of the law. And that's very a summarization of the purpose, the threefold purpose of the law. That's what the, and we tie this back into 1 Timothy 1 8, where Paul's saying these pastors were not using the law lawfully. And then he goes on to illustrate how it should be used. It's for the unsaved to lead them to faith in Christ. So what we see here is that I brought you to those to illustrate or summarize the threefold purpose of the law to tie in what these pastors in Ephesus didn't understand. They didn't understand the true threefold purpose of the law. And therefore, they, can't, they couldn't give life to their congregation. They couldn't grow up spiritually because the law was only going to serve to condemn them. And plus, they weren't even using it properly they, altogether. They were using these genealogies to get myths out of them. They were basically fantasizing or just, uh, using their imagination to pull these things out of the Mosaic law. So they were totally out in left field and Paul was seeking to correct them. And we'll see more of this tomorrow evening. Thanks for, uh, thank you very much for listening in. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time to study your word. We thank you for everyone here and also those on Pal Talk and those who will view or listen to this class at a later date on the website or through the MP3s. We pray that this class would help us and instruct us in righteousness, give us encouragement, and strengthen us and rebuke us if necessary. We just thank you so much, Father, for saving us through your Son and giving us the true meaning of the law. And we thank you for the fact that it has led us to faith in Christ. And we thank you for teaching us that the law can't give life because we, we're not perfect, we're sinners, but only faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, can give us life. So we just thank you and praise you for that. And also, Father, we pray that you give us traveling mercies on the way home with this big storm out there. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.